Good evening. Are we, are we on here? Oh, we are. There we are. Well, good evening. Wow, it's like full in here. I mean, who would expect less at a Denny Heck Town Hall right now? So I am Tim Stokes, and I'm the president here at South Puget Sound Community College. And on behalf of the board, the faculty, and staff here at the college, I want to welcome you to South Puget Sound Community College, who was just named one of the 50 best community colleges in the nation. And I know many of you are here for your first time, but can you believe this is a community college arts center? Really? Woohoo! <laughs> Hooray. So one introduction I want to make, uh, who, someone who's just worked tirelessly for our system and for the state of Washington, the executive director of the State Board of Community and Technical Colleges, Marty Brown. Marty. So Marty's kind of the guy that gets us the money to build these great buildings. So Marty, thank you. So if, in case you didn't know, South Puget Sound Community College is a college of 6,000 students. Most people don't think about our college being that size. They don't think about us graduating <coughs> 1,700 students every year. And almost any time you interact with first responders or service providers in the community, you're probably interacting with a South Puget Sound Community College graduate. And on top of that, it's just an amazing campus. When we bring people to the campus, they're like, this doesn't look, seem, or feel like a community college. I'm like, well, it's not. It's one of the 50 best community colleges. <laughs> so that's why it doesn't feel that way. So welcome. I, I am honored to be here. But most of all, I'm honored to introduce Congressman Heck. In 2012, residents of Washington's new 10th Congressional District elected Denny Heck to be the district's first member of the U.S. House of Representatives. Representatives. Since getting elected, his top priorities have been creating jobs, growing the economy, and keeping the American dream alive for the middle class and those working to get into it. He serves on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. You've probably seen him recently making some statements, and wearing his Gonzaga t-shirt. He's a native Washingtonian who graduated from the Evergreen State College and served his community. Go Gooey Ducks! If Les Purse was here, we would sing the Gooey Duck song, but I have to have Les help me. Prior to his work in Congress, he successfully grew several small businesses in Washington State, one of those small businesses started with only two employees and today employs more than 300 people. He's a strong advocate of open government and co-founded TVW, yay Denny for TVW, to provide people across the state greater accessibility to their state government. He's a strong supporter of education. He and his wife Paula have built an endowment here at South Puget Sound to help low, low socioeconomic students and students of color. In fact, Congressman Heck is one of the, our most generous donors and was recently initiated into the President's Club, which is our largest donors here at South Puget Sound. So before we bring Congressman Heck out, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Congressman Denny Heck. Thank you. That's very kind of you. Good evening, and thank you so much for being here this evening. Thank you, Tim, for the Kind of, where'd Tim go? Thanks, Tim, very much for the kind invitation. 
in case you didn't figure it out, there's a reason why South Puget Sound Community College is, what is, is one of the top 50 community colleges in America. It's because we have one of the top 50 presidents in America. That's, that's a flat out fact of the matter. Um, I can't help but reflect that I came up here to attend the Evergreen State College in its very first year of operation 46 years ago. And I think at the time, South Puget Sound Community College was an outpost of Centralia Community College. It was literally a Quonset hut or two. And look around you. It is an incredible, vibrant institution that serves the needs of this community so very well. And we ought all to be thankful for that. And I wanted to acknowledge it. I also want to acknowledge the person to whom Tim alluded, and that is my wife, Paula. Serving in public office is a family affair, impacts the whole family. And indeed, uh, this next Monday, where are you, honey? Raise your hand, there you are. Paula K. Frusi, half the retired principal of Jefferson Middle School, and as of next Monday, my wife of 41 years. <laughs> 41 years of wedded bliss for me. <laughs> Uh, my older son, Bob, and his incredible wife, Catherine, who is following in the family tradition of attending the Evergreen State College this fall, where she is already employed. Bob Cat, where are you? Bob and Catherine. So, mostly, though, I want to thank all of you for being here this evening and giving of your most precious commodity, your time. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Um, tonight is a part of my continuing effort to hear from you. Next week, by the way, I want to mention that I'm going to have another in the series of topical town halls. This one on the Russian investigation, which I'm integrally involved in as a member of the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. Uh, sidebar, we will follow the facts wherever they take us. I, the truth of the matter is I like having the general town halls via telephone because it's just amazing how many people you can reach. Now, I'm impressed beyond measure at the number of people who are here this evening, but two weeks ago we had a telephone town hall and 5,000 people attended, which was enormously gratifying. <laughs> but I, I tend to be particularly fond of topical town halls, uh, as is this evening because they lend themselves to deeper conversations, deep conversations. And the truth of the matter is, if anything merits a deep conversation, it is the federal budget. After all, at the end of the day, a federal budget is a statement, is the ultimate statement of our values. And that's why it requires a good, strong conversation. It's also timely. You may have noticed that about a month ago, uh, President Trump issued his proposal, and we'll be talking about that some tonight. Uh, you also probably are aware that come, Feb or come April 28th, uh, we run out of authority to spend at the federal government level. And if we don't do something about it, the federal government will shut down on April 29th if no budget is, uh, agreement is reached. Uh, so it is budget time in Washington, D.C. Uh, but we all know that topical issues, like we're here tonight on principally, are sometimes overtaken by the events of the week and other developments then become top of mind. And certainly that's the case this last week. Uh, when I was at the grocery store recently, I was stopped in the aisle, even, or evidently even egg shopping is not sacred. <laughs> and, uh, and I was asked uh, about the tomahawk attack on Syria. And so while I know that most of you are here for the advertised purpose, namely the budget, I hope you will indulge me and allow me to make a few comments about Syria. Uh, then I will quickly show a few slides on the budget, uh, which I hope will set the context that the floor will be yours. Our methodology tonight is I will take both oral questions and written questions. Oral questions, raise your hand, and we have two roving mic people. They'll come to you. If you are the shy type and you want to submit a written question, that's more than acceptable. Then raise the card, and a person will come and get it. And, Bring it to me, and we'll take as many questions as time and my energy allows. So, Syria. 
Before I lay out my several concerns with the airstrike, let me stipulate that we all share the moral outrage at the behavior of Bashar Assad, and frankly, this in many regards. Uh, his use of chemical weapons on civilians, including children, is both a war crime and an affront to humanity. And I think we all know and believe that. No. That said, Okay. So, uh, would like to be able to finish my statement. Uh, that said, I cannot find any legal authority for the president to have taken military action. Not in the Constitution. Uh, so, Here's the truth, everybody enjoys standing up here and, here, here and being applauded, and I do appreciate it, but for every amount of time we spend applauding, it will mean there'll be some number of people who won't be able to get to their questions, so thank you. But, um, so I find no authority, no legal authority for him to do this in the Constitution, uh, not in the War Powers Resolution, and not in the authorized use of military force, which was adopted in 2002 and was restricted for military action against what we then called Al-Qaeda, and it's kind of morphed somewhat into ISIS. Uh, and I will admit to wondering where the president's moral outrage was in 2013 when more than 10 times, more than 10 times as many civilians were uh, being killed from chemical attacks, and he went on a literal tweet storm arguing that absolutely nothing should happen. And I also wonder where the president's moral outrage was when he was systematically making it harder to deal with Syrians who had been displaced by this horrific civil war, which, by the way, is fully half the Syrian population. At the end of the day, what is happening to the people of Syria is a humanitarian crisis of epic proportions. And the question is, what are we going to do to help? And I cannot help but observe that Thank God, when Stephen Jobs' Syrian parents came here, no one stopped them at the border and turned them away and sent them to some other country to develop and invent all those Apple products. But really, to get to the gist of this, my biggest concern is that this action begs the question, what's next? Where are you going with this? What's your policy? Because there is none. And I frankly admit, acknowledge unabashedly that I have no confidence in this administration to fashion a forward-thinking policy, nor to build a coalition in support or pursuit of that policy. So that said, let's turn to the budget. I promise to be relatively brief in my PowerPoint. Uh, my effort, again, is to put the the budget in context for you. Let me get my notes here and then we'll go to slide one, please. So this is the federal budget. It's about $3.8 trillion. Uh, that, that's the expenditure pie. Uh, Social Security is about 24%. Other mandatory, I'll talk about that in a minute, is about 21%. Medicare is about 18%. Defense is about 15%. Non-defense discretionary, a word I don't really much like because it suggests that you can do without it. In many cases, I don't think that's a good idea at all. 16%. And then net interest is 6%. That's the interest we pay uh, for the treasury securities that we sell in order to finance our deficit. $3.9 trillion annual expenditure. Now, most of you are real familiar you understand what Social Security is, you understand what Medicare is, and you understand what defense expenditures are. So let's take a quick look at the other two biggies. Slide two, please. Oops. So I'm going to take, I'm going to go back to non-defense here. That's the, I guess that's purple, right? And that's, that's a bar chart by billions of the things we do, and this is the correspondence. So starting at the bottom, the 87 billion, that's transportation. That's things like helping us decongest I-5 or Amtrak, uh, support of Amtrak. That's, then comes education. Uh, that's all the things that you're familiar with. Federal support of education 
principally for Title I and what we call IDEA, that's support of those who have developmental disabilities. Veterans benefits is next and services, that's somewhat self-explanatory. Health, that would be, for example, the National Institute of Health and the research they do on seeking to find cures to cancer. Above that then comes natural resources and environment. Uh, that would include the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Interior, and the uh, Parks Department as well. One more is uh, the uh, International Affairs. That's not just the State Department, it's also USAID, it's the Peace Corps. Any Peace Corps volunteers in the crowd? Give them a hand. Yeah. And, and then that large one up there, uh, other discretionary, well that's a, that's a whole series of things. That's the Department of Justice, including the Federal Bureau of Investigation. It's Housing, Urban and Development. It's NASA. It's the National Institute of Science. The other mandatory spending, which is this red quadrant here, uh, fairly obvious, offsetting receipts, that's like Medicare Part B, those of you on Medicare paying a premium. Income security, uh, that would be unemployment compensation, it would be WIC, it would be SNAP, it would be uh, TANF or, or SSI, what we could generally consider to be uh, uh, welfare. And then federal, civilian, and military retirement, those are their pensions. Uh, then the veterans program, think basically health care delivery for veterans. Uh, and then other programs uh, as well. Next slide, please. So I'm somebody who often advocates for increased expenditures for things that I think are good investments on behalf of all of us and that lift us all up. Uh, but I never fail to make a point that we do have a deficit that we all should be aware of, especially because it's going to increase in the years ahead. So zero would be a balanced budget. And you can see that this covers the period 1940 and projected into the next 10 years that we've only been in surplus in the modern era during the late 90s. So here's what happened. We're in surplus. We then prosecute two wars and engage in, uh, enact massive tax cuts, and as a consequence, we dip into a deficit. We begin to pull back from those wars. Our economy heats up, and so it begins to go up. And then this peak right before it precipitously drops, we all know what that is. That was the Great Recession. Uh, then, we came, then we came out of it as, uh, as the economy slowly but surely began to improve. But you can see the dotted line, which is projected. We're headed in the wrong direction again. Uh, that is as a consequence of some uh, more tax cuts that were enacted. Uh, and this is something that we should all be concerned about, because remember the debt service thing on the bit first pie chart? That will grow as the Federal Reserve Board begins to ratchet up the cost of money. Next slide, please. So, as I indicated earlier, President Trump issued his uh, budget proposal. No, 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 I'm going to put some things up there. <laughs> Um, gonna be a long night. Uh, he issued his budget proposal uh, about a month ago, and in the course of the last few months, he's indicated what his budget parameters are. And the first one is, he will not grow the deficits. Whatever action he takes on increased spending or decreased tax, tax revenue, he he indicated we're not going to make these deficits grow any more than they are. He has also said repeatedly, one at a time please, he will not touch Medicare and Social Security. And you remember how big, what a big part of, of the budget pie they were, they, they were. He said he wouldn't do that. Thirdly, he's proposed massive tax cuts, principally on high income people, uh, but also on middle class, which frankly was an exaggeration of the benefit to them as a percentage of the whole. Uh, so, that, so the revenues are going down. He has also said, next please, that he's going to have a large buildup. He's proposed a $54 billion increase in defense expenditures. And lastly, he said that he wants to spend up to a trillion dollars investing in infrastructure. So here's the issue. 
that, myth, that arithmetic doesn't work. Um, that arithmetic doesn't work because if you really are serious about each of these things, then something pretty horrendous will happen. And let's go to the next slide and let me tell you what I mean. Remember when he said, not going to grow the deficit, he's going to increase military expenditures here, he's not going to touch Medicare or Social Security or Medicare. And what that means is that the red square, or the red slice, and this slice, all of the pressure to close the gap for reduced expenditures, increased expenditures on the military, if we're going to keep the deficit not growing, then they have to be cut very, very significantly. And I might just add that we are now spending on the discretionary portion of our budget the least percent as, as a percent of the GDP as we have had in 60 some years. So it's not like we're starting from a high water mark. As a percentage of GDP, we're not investing in that area as we once did. So what might this mean back home, right? At the end of the day, next slide please, there will be cuts if his budget were to be adopted that would affect the Puget Sound, or that would affect all of Puget Sound and Washington State. To begin with, he proposes to cut the Environmental Protection Agency by 31%. Um, very disturbingly to me within this is he, pro he proposed that we zero out the program to help restore the Puget Sound. Uh, any of you have been following what I've been trying to get done in the Congress, you know I've invested an incredible amount of time in attempting to restore the health of the Puget Sound. The Puget Sound is not just iconic, it's not just how we define ourselves and the identity we have for ourselves, it is in fact the very heart of both our commerce and our recreation. And it is dying, slowly but surely. And he has proposed that all federal funds disappear for that effort, among a lot of effort, other efforts with respect to environmental protection. Next. The National Endowment for the Arts and National Endowment for the Humanities eliminated. You might ask, well, how could we ever benefit from that? I'll give you an example of just one little expenditure that is currently being made that is an example of something I think is good to happen. There are about $900,000 being spent working with the State Library to digitize and save for all posterity newspapers from Washington State from 1870 uh, well into the 20th century. Those resources will be lost forever if we do not capture them digitally. So that's just one example of the, something that would go away. Next, funding for the medical research at the Nas at National Institute of Health is cut by 18% in dollar figures, that's $6 billion. Uh, what that means to us is that Fred Hutchison is going to get reduced very significantly. You already probably know that the University of Washington is the single largest recipient of health research of any public university in the United States of America. And they would see a significant reduction in that. Uh, next, international affairs budget slash 31%. My favorite quote uh, about what this might mean comes from a native son, son of Washington State, someone who serves in President Trump's uh, cabinet. His name is General James Mattis. He was born and raised in the Tri-Cities area. And when he was the commander of what we call CENTCOM, the Central European Theater, uh, he said, and I quote, if you do not fully fund the State Department, I have to buy more ammunition. Uh, this, is, this is penny wise and pound foolish, as my mother used to say, if we were to do this. Uh, lastly, uh, about $200 million in federal grants to Washington State by other programs are slashed or eliminated. Give you an example, the city of Olympia uh, has worked very, very hard to stand up the Providence Community Care Center downtown in cooperation, coordination, and partnership with Providence Hospital, the city of Olympia, uh, and several nonprofits. Uh, they received a $200,000 grant via what we call the Community Development Block Grant to do that. The Community Development Block Grant program would be zeroed out. And all such support for programs like that would eliminate. So as you might tell, I have concerns about his proposed uh, budget, uh, and that is an understatement. Uh, and it's that for which we are here to speak principally tonight. And I'm going to invite you at this time, you want to put the last slide up,
just as, oh, I thought we had the other one, that one. For those of you who want to write down, these are ways to stay in touch or connected with us. And at this time, I'm going to ask you, if you've got a comment and you want to raise your hand, I would be glad to be. He's getting the mic. If you're recording that, you need to know it'll be on TCTV. You have cable TV. I'd ask that you just give your first name. Don't have to give your email address or cell phone. Uh, I'd like to know why you keep uh, having Social Security in the budget when it's not part of the federal budget. It's funded by workers and their employers. It has nothing to do with the federal deficit. And anybody who says that, that's not true. So uh, I hope you'll follow up and take a look at the legislation that uh, I signed on to last week that would create uh, Social Security solvency through the year 2100. Uh, and it, I have it, some ideas, but you probably, I don't know if you want to hear them or not. Well, <laughs> we'd, we'd be glad to receive all ideas, but I, I think it would be good to exchange ideas. So please, by all means, take a look at uh, some of what we've proposed. Uh, you know, I know that there is this meme out there that is propagated by those who would like to see Social Security voucherized or privatized. And what they say, what they say is, it's not going to be there for you anyway. And frankly, from where I sit, they're trying to lull you into a sense of inevitability. And it's just not true. It's just not true. Social Security is going to be there uh, for your children and for my grandchildren going into the future. You know, if you were to remove Social Security income from the elderly in this country, uh, the poverty rate would go from approximately 10% into the 40s. Social Security is the single most effective and successful federal government program in our nation's history. How can we stop the Republican plan to defund Planned Parenthood? <sighs> Boy, they seem intent, don't they? Um, well, they, they already passed it out of the Senate, and the question is what the House will do when it gets here. Uh, I would give you the same recommendation and advice on that that I would any of these things that you care about, and that's stand up and speak out. And, and, and lest you think that this is, what, cliché? or disingenuous, I want to remind you all what happened two or three weeks ago on a Friday when we defeated the effort to repeal the Affordable Care Act. And uh, I, I would say about the Affordable Care Act that it has flaws and some people have been damaged by it and that we have an obligation to try and fix those. Uh, I don't think that the problems that it has in any way, shape, or form, would they outweigh throwing 24 million people under the bus and taking away their health care insurance? And so uh, I, I offer it as Exhibit A. America stood up and spoke out, and we were successful. But for those of you who care about the Affordable Care Act, I think it's important for you to know that that was a battle. That was not the war. And uh, the war continues. We were told on Thursday before we left uh, Washington, D.C., that the majority might call us back because they have a new iteration on repeal of the Affordable Care Act. I don't frankly think they're going to do that during this recess, uh, but their efforts will continue. So I would make the same point about those of you who uh, think that Planned Parenthood should not be defunded. And oh, by the way, I count myself among you. I've defended it at every turn wherever I could, and I will continue to do so. Up there. My name is Hank. Whoa. <laughs> Are you okay? 
With so many Republicans and so many Democrats taking so much money from corporations and special interests, how are we ever going to clean this mess up? So, uh, let, let me tell you, first of all, that I don't believe that corporations are people, and I don't believe that money is speech. Uh, I, I have co-sponsored just about every conceivable fix to that that came along, and the chances of any of them passing in the current majority are slim and none. Uh, and slim just left the room, as I like to say. Uh, and so the, the, the question is, is how are we going to deal with this? Well, first of all, I don't think that you should in any way minimize the cumulative value of doing things at the local level that will roll up. Uh, and what I mean by that is, Local governments and state governments are adopting curbs on this that continue to get tested in court. And some of them are meeting muster. And so it is very possible to always think locally as well. There are things that we can and should do locally to prevent this. I also would suggest to you that there is a bigger problem in politics. I get in trouble for saying this, but it's what I believe, so here we go. I think gerrymandering of congressional districts is a bigger problem. And, and, and frankly, we should all be rather proud of living in a state that has an independent redistricting commission. I don't think it's perfect, but I think it's a lot better than most. And to give you an idea, and let me be real clear, both parties are guilty of this. Uh, but let me, give you, let me give you an example. In the state of Pennsylvania, there are 18 members of the U.S. House of Representatives. There are 13 Republicans, and there are five Democrats. 13 Republicans and five Democrats. Republicans have controlled the state legislature and the governor's office, not now, but when the lines were redrawn. 13 Republicans, five Democrats. In the state of Pennsylvania, Democrats have a one million voter registration advantage. And yet there are 13 Republicans and five Democrats. And if you wanted to, you could find a state where the Democrats had done essentially the same thing. Uh, I, I think this is every bit as big a problem is campaign finance, which I think is going to take a long time to solve, and I'm committed to doing that whenever and wherever I can and will into the future. Oh, here we go. What can we do to combat Scott Pruitt and the EPA overturning so many environmental regulations and denying the science of CO2 contributing to global warming? So you're probably going to get tired of hearing me say the same kind of thing to you this evening for questions like this, but the truth of the matter is uh, we need to stand up and speak out. Uh, I'll be very clear about where I come from on the issue of climate change. There is as much evidence to suggest that there is climate change occurring in this, on this planet as a consequence of human activity as there is evidence to suggest that the sun will come up in the east tomorrow. Um, if you went to the doctor because you weren't feeling well and the doctor said to you after thorough examination I'm so sorry you have cancer you'd probably think I need to get a second opinion and if you did that 100 times and each of these doctors said you have cancer, you need to get uh, chemotherapy. And if you did that 100 times, and 97 doctors said you have cancer, you should have chemotherapy, two said we don't know, and one said you didn't, would you take your chemotherapy? Because that is quite literally the math of the scientific community on the presence of global warming caused by human activity. And so, as long as we have an administrator of the Environmental Protection Agency who does not believe in that, we are going to have an uphill battle. You wanted me to take two at a time? No, oh, it's related. Do you think the R's will push back on the EPA budget proposal? So there, I'm glad. Thank you, Phil. Um, 
the president came out with his budget, and as you can no doubt tell, I'm not a very big fan of it. That's my stab and understatement. Um, and almost immediately, the Republican chair of the House Appropriations Committee dismissed it with harsh language. So he's going to have some problems going forward. And again, I'm going to cite what happened to us on the Affordable Care Act. Uh, if you believe that the Environmental Protection Agency, which isn't perfect by a long shot, but by and large is taking good care of this planet and trying to make sure that we become good ancestors to our descendants, uh, then speaking up on the budget is one way to check Scott Pruitt. Because remember, Article I of the United States Constitution isn't the executive branch. It's the Congress. And it's the Congress that has the responsibility to appropriate funds. The executive branch can't appropriate funds. Scott Pruitt can't say, I'm not going to spend money on things that Congress appropriates and asks me to or directs me to. So I would suggest that one of the best ways to check him uh, is, frankly, to speak up during the budget process. And we are engaged in that now, which is why we are there. Lauren? Oh, OK. Hi. My name's Ben. Um, Thank you, first, for defending the Affordable Care Act. So you mentioned that there are flaws, and one of those flaws is that the most common reason for bankruptcy in this country is medical expenses. People go bankrupt from medical bills all the time, all across this country. And there's a solution to this that the rest of the modern world has somehow figured out. It's called single-payer health care. And we actually have single-payer health care in America right now. It's called Medicare. And there, there's a bill in the House right now. It's called H.R. 676 that would extend Medicare to cover everybody to cover everybody. So everyone's covered single payer. Health care is guaranteed. And you have chosen to not co-sponsor this bill, and I would like to know why. Um, thank you very much for your passion. And thank you very much for the respect you extend to me to give me an opportunity to, to explain my position. Uh, I genuinely believe, I genuinely believe that efforts to extend health care coverage to more people in whatever form, by and large, make America healthy and a better place. And I, and I support that advocacy. Uh, and in fact, I, I would just remind you all that I did not get to Congress in my first effort. Uh, I ran and was defeated in 2010 in the year in which the Affordable Care Act was adopted. I was not a member of Congress. I did not have access to staff. I did have access to some information. When asked how I would have voted, I said yes. And there are very few people that would look at that race and conclude other than that contributed to my defeat. And I'm fine on that. I'm just fine on that. Uh, my effort in that regard has continued. The war before the United States Congress right now is to save the Affordable Care Act. And I've expended a considerable amount of my time and effort in that regard, and I will continue to. But you're right. I've declined to become a co-sponsor of uh, H.R. 6776. And I, and I do so because I frankly don't think it's fully formed. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Uh, well, you shake your head. Give me a chance. Okay. It, you know, it's okay that we disagree. I'm okay on that. Um, first of all, the Medicare for All Act would in fact take a part of what many people consider to be a part of their Medicare away from them. And that's the 400,000 people in this state who have Medicare Advantage. It would be eliminated under the Medicare for All Act. There'd be no Medicare Advantage. Um, secondly, there are about 20% of all hospitals in this country that are private, for profit. They would essentially be immediately illegal. And oh, by the way, 
So would 70% of nursing homes, which are for profit. And the reality is that there is nothing in the proposal which deals either, for example, with Medicare Advantage or with how is it that we would make this incredible transition from basically saying one in five hospitals, you no longer have a legal corporate uh, governance structure or the 70% of all nursing homes. There's no plan for how we get from here to there in it. But lastly and most importantly, if you talk to hospitals and providers, as I do all the time, they would tell you that Medicare reimbursement rates in and of themselves are not sustainable, that they cannot be a sustainable enterprise on the basis of Medicare reimbursement. And there is nothing, there is nothing in this HR 676 which would plan for the migration from Medicare as we know it today, which the bill says it applies to everybody, but which doesn't provide for a means of making a sustainable delivery of health care. Those are just three, frankly, more or less off the top of my head, reasons why I've declined to, to sign on to the bill. But I will end where I began. Uh, I think we're a much better country, a much stronger country, if more people have health care. We've cut the number of uninsured in this nation in half. And oh, by the way, you couldn't be more correct about bankruptcy rate, except for that as we've cut it in half, so bankruptcy's gone down. And I think that's a good thing, and I think we need to continue on that trajectory. The current administration has made a lot of promises about infrastructure. Washington has more than a thousand bridges that are structurally unsound or obsolete, none of which are addressed in the current proposal. Transportation, taxes, something 13%. How will Washington State something bridge, enable bridge safety without federal funding? Well, we won't. I mean, the, the, historic, the historic approach to transportation funding is a partnership between local, state, and the federal government. And uh, neither alone has the resources to bring us up to speed. On this issue of infrastructure, let's remember that the American Society of Civil Engineers gave America's infrastructure overall a, a D plus. Uh, our competitors throughout the globe are literally leapfrogging ahead of us in this regard and they are going to gain a competitive advantage if we're not willing to step up to this. What can we do to save the TIGER program to continue investments in infrastructure projects? You know, interestingly enough, I'm a big believer that we need to spend more money on infrastructure. Uh, and interestingly enough, it was one of the very few things that candidate Trump said during the campaign that I thought we had an opportunity to forge some bipartisan support for, because he said it repeatedly too. Um, if he were to have asked me, and oh, by the way, he hasn't called to ask me my advice on much of anything yet, <laughs> I would have recommended to him strongly at the beginning of his administration, start on something for which you can achieve success through bipartisanship. And the number one nominee had to be infrastructure investment. Had to be infrastructure investment. Um, and he chose not to. He chose to join with House Republicans to go after repeal of the Affordable Care Act um, and to schedule the vote to repeal it on the seventh anniversary of its signing. That was more than symbolic. That was more, that was more than symbolic. And, and I think he really missed the boat. I think, I think we had a real opportunity and I'd like to think we still have an opportunity to figure this out. Because what I do think is at stake is America's competitive position in the world. Our ports, our bridges, rural broadband, I could go right in water, Flint, Michigan, anybody? Uh, I could go right on down the list of what it is I think uh, we could invest public funds in to elevate the health of the economy and the individuals that occupy it. Uh, and and I, I frankly am sad that he missed this opportunity. My, hi, my name is Sophia. What is your plan to stop Trump from taking money from public schools? What yeah. can I do to help? 
Sophia, where do you go to school? Where do you go to school, Sophia? Mountain View Elementary. Mountain View Elementary School, you bet. What grade are you in? First. Well, you got a great start, Sophia, let me tell you. So President Trump's uh, budget proposal would reduce uh, federal support of education, uh, principally in the areas that I alluded to earlier by uh, 13 plus percent. Uh, and I would, would remind you all, there are plenty of educators in this room, that when the federal government adopted uh, what was then called the Education for All Act, as well as Title I, it made certain commitments about what percent of the support it would provide, and it's never lived up to them. And now comes along a proposal which would step back from that very considerably. Um, so, Sophia, I'm going to get back to my old saw, my old uh, chestnut here. Uh, stand up and speak out as you have tonight. This is part and parcel of the budget debate that is just starting in Washington, D.C. And you have lots of friends. You have lots of friends on both sides of the aisle, not to take that kind of what I would characterize as a meat axe to our support for public education. If I may, let me just tell you why this is so important to me. Uh, I'm the last guy in the world that ought to be standing up here wearing this pen. I really am. Uh, my dad drove truck. My mom was a telephone operator. Uh, when my dad came home from school one day in the beginning of the ninth grade year, he was met uh, at the doorstep by my grandfather, who spoke only broken English. His native language was German. They lived on a very hard scrabble farm in South Dakota. And Grandpa told Dad, uh, you have to quit school. My dad was the oldest of six children. And uh, you have to do that in order to help save the family farm. That was in the late fall of 1929. And the Great Depression had hit. As a consequence of that, I grew up in a household where just about every week uh, at the dinner table, my, my father would give this speech in some form or another. They can take everything away from you but your education and so get one. I've been uh, enormously privileged to be the product of an outstanding public school education, Lakeshore Elementary School, Jason Lee Junior High School, Columbia River High School, uh, Clark College, I went to before I transferred to Evergreen. Whoever in their right mind decided to have as their mascot the penguin, I will never understand. <laughs> Yeah, but then again, I don't know, did it get worse? I'm a gooey duck through and through now. <laughs> Why should we spend $15 billion on our border wall when we have so many better uses for the money? <laughs> Will you oppose funding the border wall? Let me make this clear, yes. And oh, by the way, if you didn't note the, the latest news development, uh, property owners throughout the southern border of the United States have banded together to resist the federal government's effort to take over their land. Uh, Lauren? Hi, my name's Jeff Sowers. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, I'm a, uh, oh, excuse me, a, a Thurston County Democrat precinct committee officer and a local high school teacher. Uh, which high and, school? Uh, well, it's in Elma, East Grays Harbor High yeah. School, a small yeah. alternative high school in Elma, Washington. Yeah. So um, I'm going to bring this back to Syria. Um, as you, I'm sure you're aware, uh, this recent strike against Syria is not the first act of illegal war against the Syrian government. For about five years now, the U.S. government has been prosecuting a regime change war against the Syrian government. The CIA has trained thousands of fighters and facilitated the flow of billions and billions of dollars of weapons into Syria. Uh, this war has devastated uh, Syria, as I'm sure you're aware. And we're doing this despite uh, the common, commonly known that many of these weapons are ending up in the hands of Al-Qaeda, who are linked to the U.S.-backed groups through battlefield alliances. If you want references on that, you can take a look at Tulsi Gabbard's 
bill, the Stop Arming Terrorist Act, which, which you have uh, up to now declined to support. I'd ask you to support that. I know that, okay, I'm going to ask my question here. I, you, I know you know about this because you've supported this war with at least two votes. Most recently, just this past December, you voted to escalate the war still further by providing anti-aircraft weapons uh, to these groups. What I don't understand is how can you think another regime change war in the Middle East is a good idea? Thank you. So, uh, with all due respect, sir, I disagree with your characterization of my vote. I do not support intervention in the war in Syria, in that civil war, uh, whatsoever. Uh, however, the authorized use of military force from 2002 and subsequent actions have to do with fighting ISIS, who had taken over a huge area in both Iraq uh, and in some parts Syria. But I do not support regime change. Uh, I do not support getting involved in the war in Syria, uh, nor will I. I, I. I disagree with your characterization of what that vote did. It's, let's. All right. So this is a little interesting. They, it's, they brought it typed out. What's. Who, results, who brought this? <laughs> Thank you, Rep. Hecht, for all that you do in Congress for us, your constituents. I am one of many results volunteers across the country giving voice for policy for solutions that end poverty. There was a lot of attention on inequality in the last election, yet some in Washington, D.C. are pushing forward tax breaks for the wealthy while many are struggling. Can you share about your priorities in tax reform in particular, what you are doing to support tax policies for working families like the Earned Income Tax Credit? Well, thank you very much for the question. Uh, so I actually believe that the repeal of the Affordable Care Act wasn't about health care at all. It was about granting $600 billion in tax cuts for the wealthiest of Americans. Uh, and, and, and I don't think it was a tax cut that was warranted. Uh, let me be very clear about that. Uh, the Earned Income Tax Credit is one of those few poverty combating mechanisms where we actually have some bipartisan uh, synergy on it. Even Speaker Ryan has indicated on multiple occasions that he thinks that that's an effective way to combat uh, poverty, and I do too. Uh, so we will see if in the wider context of tax reform we have an opportunity to deal with the entire spectrum of needs in our society. My fear is that it too will be basically a Trojan horse for yet more tax cuts for the wealthiest of Americans. Uh, you guys should come down there, people down here too. Yeah, Dallas? <laughs> Hi, my name's Roger. I'm a PCO out of Rochester. Um, back in, when we were choosing a Democratic candidate for the presidency, it was against Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders. And the state caucused overwhelmingly for Bernie Sanders. Can I ask you shortly, and I have a statement after that, can, who did you use your superdelegate vote for? Who did you vote for? You must be the only person on the face of the planet who doesn't know who I use my <laughs> okay, superdelegate just... for. Uh, I, I know that there are a lot of people, maybe even most of you in this room would disagree with me, but I supported Hillary Clinton because I thought she would have made the best president. <laughs> well, not everybody, <laughs> evidently. Uh, and, Please, please. 
I'm glad there are people here with strong feelings. I genuinely am. Uh, I think it is the gist of a strong democracy. But I will tell you in all sincerity, uh, I'm a big boy, I can take this, and I don't mind that. But there's something deeply, deeply concerning to me about my America when we can't talk to one another anymore without a lot of anger. Um, I noted on your second chart that the time period of the 1950s had the greatest surplus. That was a time when income tax on the wealthiest was at its highest, with income inequality at its highest since the 1920s. Why do we always seem to think that it's at all reasonable for the very wealthy to continue to receive even more tax cuts? You, you, you got me because it isn't. Um, the, the truth of the matter is that if we allow income and wealth to continue to accumulate in the concentrated amounts at the very top of the income, then it is, it is not just going to make us poor, it's going to make our economy poor. It'll hold our economy back because the wealthiest among us only spend a certain amount of their money. The rest of it goes off to the Cayman Islands or wherever uh, for investment income. So if we want an economy that grows faster, that provides increasing opportunities for people throughout this country, uh, then we have to be very careful. For the first time in history, I, I don't know if this fact is for the country or for the world, but for one or the other, for the first time since they've measured, the top 1% of our population has as much income as the bottom 50%. And, and that's, not, that's only not right. That is going to retard economic growth and opportunity. You stop and think about what America means, what the definition of it is, what our identity is. It is the land of opportunity. It is why my wife's mother came here as a child from what we affectionately refer to the old country for a better life. It's why my great-grandfather great came here from Germany for a better life, for an opportunity. People who work hard, play by the rules, can get ahead. But if we allow a rigged tax system uh, and the rules to benefit only the wealthiest, uh, then we are not who we set out to be. So how can we go about achieving income equality? Uh, I think a fair tax system. I think a fair tax system would be one of the most important things that the federal government can do. I also think, uh, getting back to Sophia's question, having a good, strong education system. Education is the escalator of upward mobility in the society, and it is up to the public to support that education. Even if we don't have children in school, or anymore, and I don't, I have a 27-month-old grandchild who will be entering school in three years. She is, by the way, the most beautiful grandchild ever born. <laughs> And making sure that she can go to her local public school and get a world-class education benefits us all. And that's another way. Hi, my name is Walt, and I have a two-piece question. As you, uh, everyone knows that with the expansion of Medicaid, many Americans received health care for the first time and have had wellness and a good effect from it. The Republicans have a standard policy about this thing, is to cap Medicare and block grant to the cap states. Cap Medicaid. Medicaid, sorry. And yes. block grant. Yes. So that's the first question. Would you support that? The second one is you mentioned in your presentation about the government, the uh, president's proposals, his uh, things he was after was he wanted to uh, not have an increase in the deficit. So already in his first 90 days, he spent more on travel than Barack Obama did in eight years. Would you support capping the president's travel budget? So on the first question, which is do I support capping and block granting Medicaid, the answer is no. Well, you knew that. I'm not sure why you asked that. But no, I would not. On the second question, uh, I actually think there's a broader issue at play here. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm generally not trying to be partisan about this, but I think there's a very legitimate question to be asked as to whether or not the president is violating the Emoluments Clause of the Constitution. Uh, 
insofar so much of his travel has to go with reimbursing himself because he owns the properties. Uh, that's a subject for either the Government Oversight Committee or the Judiciary Committee. Uh, the oversight that I am seeking to involve myself in, as you all know, is my new assignment on the Intelligence Committee in our examination of Russian interference in our elections. So. Read Trump's budget plan. There's been a lot of coverage of the West Coast governors aligning as a metaphoric wall against Trump's travel ban and immigration policies. Is there a similar coalition in place to protect West Coast interests, specifically trade, the environment, and infrastructure? Um, no, but you give me something to think about. Thank you very much. <laughs> Lauren, where are you? First of all, uh, hi, my name is Alex and this is Lincoln. Um, I was just, I wanted to comment uh, more on the healthcare question. Um, I, I just think the whole concept of healthcare insurance in America is a lie that our government is taking care, um, is taking advantage over us. Um, because basically insurance is in case something happens. I have renter's insurance in case my house floods. Statistically though, it's not gonna happen. So the money that I pay in goes towards the people who actually get their house flooded. However, we do know that every single person in this room needs healthcare. They all will be sick at some point. It's not an if kind of question, it's just a when kind of question. So when we talk about it, we say healthcare insurance, which is a lie because we know we all need it. Um, so we end up being at the mercy of the insurance companies who have the monopoly on the market, who purposefully working on failing um, Obamacare um, in order to go back to the free market where we are um, ending up in their mercy. And it basically acts um, as a barrier for women um, low-income families and minorities to remove them from social and economic process of the country because, for example, women who don't have access um, to insurance end up bankrupt, um, can put their children in daycare, and so on. So I was just wondering, if, since you're not supporting the Medicare for All um, initiative, what other alternatives are you proposing apart from just defending Obamacare? Because that's basically propagating the same lie, which is uh, redistrib redistribution of income between the 1% and the wealthy corporations. And we are paying for it. Um, well, Allison, we disagree. Um, I, I don't believe that that's all that the Affordable Care Act does. I think the Affordable Care Act has done some pretty incredibly wonderful things. Uh, I have people... So we put out an all call when we were in the midst of the Affordable Care Act debate, and I said, I, I want you to write me if your life has been positively impacted by the Affordable Care Act. And we received about 150 emails and letters almost immediately about people... Uh, I, I, I've already answered the question. So, so in, in general, I believe that this would be a better country if everybody had health care, and that doesn't mean access to health care. Hell, we've all got access to a Lamborghini doesn't mean we can all afford it. It's largely a, it's largely a question of how we get from here to there. And th there is a particular improvement that I would like to see, for example, in the Affordable Care Act, which is to make sure that those counties who are down to one insurer or no insurers have a public option. Uh, and I think that would be a very strong step forward in getting to where we all want to be. Uh, we have a lot of shy people in this room. <laughs> is funding for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau at risk in the Trump budget? Oh, you better believe. Um, I serve on the Financial Services Committee, and uh, for four years we've been dealing with some uh, kind of nonstop attacks on the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, let, let me be very clear. I don't think the Dodd-Frank bill was perfect. I don't think there's been any major legislation ever enacted by the United States Congress that was perfect on the first try, uh, to say the least. Uh, but I do believe that it has returned literally billions of dollars to American com consumers who have been fleeced by uh, inappropriate and unethical practices. 
Uh, and if you, if, if you don't think we need the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, then I guess you like what Wells Fargo Bank did when they, they uh, created 2.1 million uh, fake accounts and fleeced people uh, from their money on those accounts by the, the uh, collection of fees. So yes, they're going after the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Uh, the CFPB, like every other financial services uh, regulatory entity, is off budget. It's not appropriated. They get their funds from the Federal Reserve. Uh, and, and what the majority has proposed doing is moving away from a single director, uh, Rich Cordray, the former Attorney General of Ohio, and five-time Jeopardy champion 20-some years ago in his youth. Uh, and creating a five-member a five commission and subjecting, uh, subjecting uh, the Bureau to appropriation. They want to do that basically so they can strangle it. Uh, and that's going to be quite a fight. The chair, of the, the chair of the Financial Services Committee was scheduled to vote on a bill which would have done just what I've described uh, in March. And I believe what happened at one point is his leadership went to him and said, you know, this might not be that popular with the American public, so you might want to pull back. Now he's saying he's going to get to it in the summer, and it's going to be quite the battle, let me tell you. Dallas. My name is Jim. Uh, thank you for being here tonight. A lot of our representatives are hiding out and not having that much contact with the public. Um, I know that I am, and I think a, a large number of people the majority of people in this country are getting very frustrated because we don't seem to get the attention of our representatives and they don't seem to be doing what we want them to do. Um, it's very obvious now with this election that the corporations have made a major step forward in getting control of our government um, through the courts, through the legislature, and that um, if they continue on this path, we will end up with a corporate-controlled fascist state. And uh, you've mentioned several times that the public must not allow this to happen. But I think most of us would like to know specifically what we can do to stop this. So, um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Jim. And oh, by the way, as it relates to growing frustrated with the, your representatives not doing what you want to them, what you want them to, welcome to my world. Uh, they're not doing what I would want them to do either. But again, I'm going to hearken back to, uh, for those of you who did not want to see 24 million people thrown under the bus for the Affordable Care Act repeal, America stood up and spoke out, and it made a difference. And I, I would suggest to you that there are going to be two or three battles of epic proportion in the United States Congress in this calendar year where big things are at stake and on the line. And it, that's the time to stand up and speak out and write letters to the editor and contact me. Don't for one second, don't for one second think that just because you're one voice, it doesn't matter, that it doesn't play into the whole, the chorus that rises above the din of the day-to-day -day political fight and make a difference because it does. I know it does. I saw it three weeks ago. And so keep standing up and speaking out. Look, you're not going to win them all. Elections have consequences. And we're not going to talk a lot about elections here tonight because I have my official hat on and it's just not appropriate. But we play the ball where it lies. And in accordance with mama's wisdom, we pick our battles, we amass our forces, and we go at it for all we're worth. And by the way, I would add, we take a minute or two to celebrate when we have an occasional victory. Because I don't know how you get up for the next battle if you don't. Well, uh, I will tell you, Jim, he, the question was how effective are demonstrations? Um, what was the date? January 21st. January 21st? On January 21st, my son and his wife and I were in Washington, D.C., marching. And. Uh, I think it's incredibly effective. But I also am a realist, and I will tell you, you cannot sustain that energy day in and day out, which is why I think you've got to pick your battles. Does the Trump budget increase taxpayer support 
for the private prison industry. Would you oppose all efforts to increase support to the private prison industries? Uh, I don't know what it does for the private prison industry. I wouldn't be surprised, and I am no fan whatsoever I think of private prisons. Look, you should not deliver a service like that that is inherently a public function through somebody that is incentivized to cut cost as opposed to providing the highest degree of security and safety and a good environment. So, I don't, you know, look, as, as Dr. Stokes said, I came from the private sector. I've been in and out of the public sector my whole life and I was in the private sector. There are some things the private sector does very well and we should expect them to do that. There are a whole lot of things they don't do very well at all. They're not real good at building roads. They're not real good at providing a public school education or a public education for people. And, <laughs> all right, all right. Lauren? We're gonna go that side first. Good evening, Congressman. My name is Bill. Thank you, I'm a veteran. Uh, thank you for all the work you do for veterans. Thank you. What branch? I was in the Army. Thank you, Bill. And secondly, I'm the vice chair of the Mason County Democrats. And as you know, we've watched a couple of mills close out there. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, and I know Trump's budget's gonna slash everything, but how do you feel about programs like CTAP and reforming and how, expanding like, them? How do I CTAP. CTAP? Yeah, the uh, Transition Assistance Program. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Trade Adjustment Assistance. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, boy. I fear like the rest of the evening will be consumed in answer to that question because I have such strong feelings about this and I'm gonna discipline myself not to do that. Um, the Trade Adjustment Assistance Program is a program designed to help dislocated workers who've lost their jobs as a consequence of an impact of trade. Uh, the needs like this, the programs like this. It doesn't come anywhere near meeting the need, Bill. Um, I've been through that. When the mill closed, I was the first person to call, what's his name, Mr. Messenger, I think, for the FFLCO who does a trade adjustment. Uh, and I was the first person to call the U.S. Department of Labor to get the Shelton Mill closure designated as a consequence. Literally the first person to call him. Uh, and I believe strongly in that program. But I don't think it's anywhere near adequate. But that's not my story. So we are all aware that there has been significant employee and worker dislocation as a consequence of globalization. Everybody knows that. You know that intuitively. You've seen that all around you. The number of people who have been dislocated as a consequence of globalization is like this compared to the number of people who in the next 20 years are about to be dislocated as a consequence of automation and robots, robots and technology. And we're not talking about it. We certainly don't have a federal public policy framework. Zero, zip, nada. Look, let me give you a couple of data points. Uh, and by the way, this time around, Bill, we might have some hope this time around because it's not just gonna be blue collar workers, it's gonna be white collar workers. And the men and women sitting behind the desk might finally get up out of their chairs and go, what are we doing here? BlackRock announced a financial services entity. They were laying off 3,000 people a couple of months ago because algorithms could do their jobs better than they could. The financial services sector, Jim Morrell, is gonna be hit hard, is it not? Jim's the CEO of Credit Union and Shelton and does an outstanding job up there. Thank you, Jim. Um, financial services and a lot of other white collar jobs are gonna be hit. Some additional blue collar jobs are gonna be hit. And they're gonna be in some surprising places. Do you remember when I told you my dad was a truck driver? At the beginning of the year, I think it was, in the state of Colorado, they test drove a self-driving semi all the way across the state. You know how many commercial driver's licenses are held in this country? 1.8 to 1.9 million people. 1.8 to 1.9 million people. Truck driving alone, financial services, tens of thousands of people. And we don't have a policy framework. So this isn't just trade adjustment, Bill. I think we got a broader question at work here. For any of you who are inclined, I would recommend you pick up one of two or three books. Um, Second Machine Age, 
The Rise of the Robots, two different books. Uh, another book, Industries of the Future, Alex Ross, um, talking about what's just right in front of us. What's right in front of us? And we are ill-prepared, and we have not even begun the conversation. So I think it's actually a much bigger question than just trade adjustment assistance, but yes. This is Phil Gardner. He's my district director here. How could the Trump budget hurt our local capacity to end hunger and homelessness? Well, it would significantly reduce the programs that go to those very purposes. Food support, they've, they've, taken, a run, they've taken a run at SNAP. We used to call it food stamps. Now, food stamps, I, I know there are people who have concerns about whether or not they're abused and so on and so forth. But the fact of the matter is a food stamp program is an incredible lifeline for people who live in poverty to be able to feed their children. And it's been, it's been a beautiful marriage between America's farmers and advocates on behalf of poor people. Uh, but they're coming after it. They're coming after all manner of the uh, programs that support homelessness. So my friend Phil Harlan is in the front row. You look good in the front row, Phil. Uh, he's a local realtor. And he and I talk about housing a lot. A lot. Um, and I believe, I believe the provision of housing is an ecosystem. Uh, and in fact, this is not just about homeless. It's about rent burden people. It's also about uh, market rate people. They're all interrelated. And what affects one part of that ecosystem affects the other. And we are, we are facing, I believe, a severe housing shortage in America. I have a friend who bought a home in northwest Seattle 30 years ago. It was a cottage, a nice little place, nothing special. Uh, he sold it the first day he listed it a couple months ago for $150,000, more than he asked. We have a structural imbalance between the supply of housing and the demand for housing. And when you have that kind of a situation, as we are now experiencing in every major urban center in America, you bet there's an increase in homelessness. You bet there is. Uh, and so they're not going to be kind to these programs. Uh, and it'll be a part of that budget debate that I've talked about. Dallas? Thank you for coming. Hi. I'm Katie. And I Katie? Want, Katie, yes. And um, over the last election, I kind of felt like the Democratic Party broke up with me, and now I don't know even how to identify myself and what I am. And I think that everyone I know has had a personal relationship and their life impacted by politics. And I think even now, like I'm really impressed with this, like we're sitting here having a discussion. Good job, Olympia. But, um, <laughs> How can we get together and make any change when us as the people are fighting against each other, Republic, Republican, Democrat, when it's all kind of the same thing? I feel like we're being divided so the people that are in charge can get away with murder. And because we're sitting around arguing with each other on Facebook. How can we start to change the language of politics to where people can listen to each other and respect each other and make things happen? So um, I think your characterization of the polarization is, is pretty much borne out. Um, there's a really smart guy named Nate Silver. You may have heard of him. He, he, he runs the website 538.com. And uh, he went back and looked at the differences between the 1992 elections for the US House and the 2012 elections for the House. So we're now five years beyond it, but it's still pretty valid. And he, he counted the number of swing districts in 1992 that could have gone either way. And there were 103 out of 435. 103, 435. The rest were over here. He went back and counted in 2012, and there were 35. So in some ways, the middle has given way. Now, I get in trouble for it sometimes, but I actually happen to think that one of the jobs of a member of Congress 
uh, is to mediate the differences in a pluralistic society. And, no, please, Kate. <laughs> uh, you know, we have people who see the world differently. And uh, the easiest thing in the world to do is yell at one another. These are genuinely held values. And there are some cases where these have to be a battle for who will win the value because they are mutually exclusive. My, my frustration, my difficulty is that on matters not like that, even, compromise has become a dirty word. And, and I, don't, I don't understand that. Um, but I'll tell you what my part is, Katie. Because at the end of the day, it only got me, right? I, I can't wave a magic wand over the other 434. But here is the standard that I attempt to hold myself to, and I invite you to hold me to it as well. Um, it, number one is always look for common ground. Never stop searching for common ground where you can build on it. And number, number two, uh, don't make it personal or demonize. Now, I don't, I don't pretend that I'm perfect in this regard, Katie, but I'm very conscious of these two values I hold. Uh, I, I work very hard to try to find common ground, even with people that I see the world very differently from. In fact, I'll give you an example. Um, some of you may know that as a consequence of my membership on the, the Financial Services Committee, I've been the House's leading proponent of making it safe for credit unions like Jim's to provide banking services to marijuana-related businesses in states where they, it's legal. And, um, well, I guess we know about some of you tonight. <laughs> um, and, uh, and we've had a difficult time getting around our chair because he wants to relitigate this issue. And I'm just saying, look, eight states now have adult recreational use. I don't know how many more allow for medical marijuana. It's a fact. Get over yourself. You're not going to turn back the clock. Uh, prohibition didn't work for alcohol, and it didn't work very effectively for marijuana. Um, and if we want to keep cash out of the hands of the gangs and the cartels, and we want to keep marijuana out of the hands of children, then having a well-regulated market is the way to do that. And those are my goals. So I've been a big advocate and a sponsor of the legislation to make it possible for them to do that. I'm sitting on the House floor in early January, and one of the members of the Republican Party who is on the committee comes over and he sits down and he says, are, are you going to reintroduce the banking access bill? And uh, uh, I was sitting next to Ed Perlmutter from Colorado, also on the committee, also on the bill. And we, without looking at one another, we both said, no, 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 you go ahead. We'll support it. We'll co-sponsor it. Thinking you're in the majority, our chances increase. And he got very enthused and he said, I can talk to Kevin McCarthy, the majority leader, because I think we got to get around the chair of the committee. And I think Kevin, now that Cal he's from California, now that California's gone there, blah, 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 blah. and I was filled with optimism that I'd finally forged a bipartisan bond to work on an issue. I don't agree with that person on hardly anything. That person got appointed to be director of OMB and is the knife behind these budget cuts, Mick Mulvaney, one week after he made that offer to, to me, right? Um, but it's an example, Katie. He, he's a Freedom Caucus member. He's, he's so far right, I can't even see him over there. And, and yet, we found an issue that we could work on together. And then he left. <laughs> uh, Lauren? I, can, I got one. Dallas? Hi. Um, sorry. <laughs> My name is Denise, and I just recently moved. I'm Sophia's mom. Um, also mother to Olivia and Oliver. And uh, <laughs> I just recently uh, moved from New Mexico with my three children, fleeing a um, pretty violent case uh, against one of my children that happened. Um, I have worked in New Mexico politics for eight years. I've worked for Congressman Ben Ray Lujan, Michelle Lujan Grisham. I served on the Rules Committee for the Democratic National Convention uh, for Hillary Clinton. Um, I have helped elect Democrats across New Mexico up and down. Um, I am now, <laughs> thank you, I am now two weeks away from living uh, in a car with my kids. Um, I am 
non-educated, and I have tons of experience. Um, Statistic-wise, being a black woman, my children are predetermined already by statistics to be um, school dropouts, high school dropouts, teen pregnancies, in violent relationships, um, and everything that I do every single day, um, every minute is, is made to make sure that my kids don't fall into a statistic. Um, I surround them with the Democratic Party, and I hope to make Olympia um, a, a family of Democrats that we can be embraced in. Um, but I just wanted to let you know that I have a resume. <laughs> <And> <laughs> And, um, <laughs> Thank you. And I may not have an education, I may not have an education, but I have experience. And I have the goals to make sure that my kids do not end up in the same situation that I do, and to make sure that they advance themselves and that they have access to quality education through high school and on through college. Um, so I really would just like to introduce myself, and um, you know, I'm putting my I'm putting applications into the state and through the city. Um, but as everybody here knows, and as you know, I go into a pool of thousands of people who are applying for the same positions, and they have the education. Um, so I just want to know, my goal is to get hired and to have a, a stable job and to sustain stability for my children, but my goal is also to reach out into the community to families who are like me, who have no clue how to access public, uh, public funds and how to get in, in involved in these programs. They think they have no, no place in politics, no place... They, they, they have no time for it when really those are the people that we need to be reaching out to and speaking to and bringing into our party. So um, two things. One, I would just like to know, um, yeah, try to put my name out there for a job. And two, how do we help people like me um, get out of the situations that they're in when they don't have the education? <laughs> Was that you, Rainey? Escort that man out. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. Uh, Denise, yes, sir. number one, welcome to Washington State. We welcome you with open arms. <laughs> number two, you have, you have my favorite female name. Uh, number three, as it relates to the services that might be available, especially if you get closer to the precipice, we have staff in Olympia that can act as referral and can help put you in touch should you get up to the, we don't run an employment agency, right. obviously, but we do know resources that are available. And uh, these guys are gonna give you a card right now so that you can be in touch with people uh, and uh, in our office and that we can maybe make sure that you don't ever have to live in your car. Oh. No, it isn't. He wrote this as the final question. No, it's not. I said I'd go, I, I, we were supposed to close at 8.30, but I said I'd go until I was out of energy, and I'm not out of energy yet. I'm a youngster. I was about to say I don't become Medicare eligible until July, but I thought I'd open that can of worms up again. <laughs> Um, the question is, will you make your slides available to the public? Sure. You betcha. That's good information. Uh, Lauren? I, how will we do that? Dennyhack.house.gov? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll hold it for you. You want to stand? No. Lauren? Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Ruben. And uh, one of my concerns is that the Democratic Party has failed me uh, the last election, but also just it's generally moved away from the base and moved into the, uh, the wealthy donors. And that's who, they're, that's who agenda they're following. 
And um, also, I'm concerned, I've read a number of studies that say the United States has become an oligarchy and is no longer a democracy. And I, and I tend to, that's what I see going on. And I'm wondering what your position is in, the, in terms of that movement, and also what the hell can we do to save the Democratic Party uh, before it becomes completely owned by uh, banks like uh, that Hillary was so active with. Um, I'd like to know how we're going to get it back to the people. So thank you, Ruben. Uh, on the latter point about what we can do about it, uh, we can, well, I got to be careful. I'm getting the eagle eye. Ruben, I'm very sorry. I'm not supposed to talk about elections and campaigns and those things. I'm supposed to, in this capacity here tonight, I'm supposed to be talking about policy. So it was like okay to talk about campaign finance because it's a proposal, but it, it's not really appropriate for me to talk about the kind of political activism you should engage in because this is, this, this is, I, I, I know, but I, on, am I an oligarch? No. No, I'm not. Right. So why aren't you an oligarch? You should be. <laughs> but we're not supposed to talk about it. Well, we're not supposed to talk about the political activism, but, but I, I would tell you why I don't self-identify that way, Ruben. I never forget where I came from, ever. I'm following you. Okay. Lauren yeah. Dallas. Yeah, I... Dallas? Donna. <laughs> okay, my name is Donna, and um, I kind of have a roundabout question. Um, better? Yes. Okay. Um, when you, when you, Politico just, re, just wrote a, a piece about the 932 uh, percent increase that employers are making versus the, since the 1970s versus the 32 percent that we, the middle class, have increased. And I think that's important in that I think that most of us would say we're confused at what he, uh, Republicans and Democrats view as a Democrat these days, or a middle class, I mean, this these days. Because it just feels like middle class is maybe $200,000 to some polit politicians, and it's at 150, dollars 75000 to others. And I, I know that I'm, I understand finance, and yet that's got me confused. What do you say about that? What, Can you answer that? What is the question? What is the, what is, what, where middle class? What oh, the... okay. So I don't tend to think of middle class in terms of a fixed dollar amount. I tend to think of it in terms of what it provides you. But you can't do and that because that's what the political, when you, when every, every bill is based on the middle class, the middle class will pay for this, the middle class will pay for that. Which middle class? The one you want or it just seems too convenient these days. I think middle class is being able to afford to purchase a home send your kids to college if they want to go, take vacations on an annual basis, and have a secure retirement. But based on the figures that I gave you that... that I think oh. it would vary by community, as a matter of fact. It's a lot cheaper to buy a home in Cusick, Washington well, than it is Seattle. Even USA Today had the same figures, and, but to put it into dollars and cents and said that we would have to make $900 more each and every week in order to make the same, have the same living my parents had in the 80s. Right. Well, there's no question that we've had uh, a really stubborn stagnation of wages in this country. They've been flat for a long time. It depends Which on has left it wide open for oligarchs to come in and fund your uh, election versus, say, me, who can help you just very little, which is, I think, where his question was, really, is where you stood and how you fund yours. Do you want, you know, and we also want to fund you as well to help you get elected, us individually. And we're not supposed to talk about Right. That. Well, I know, but it was important that yeah. I think that most of us feel that way. Thank you very much.
Morale, you wrote a book. Uh, please tell us how you will help ensure that funding for arts and humanities will not be defunded. Well, look, this is part and parcel of the broader budget debate that I alluded to and began with. We're about to have a great battle uh, over what the nature of the federal government is. Uh, and and which, whichever side you fall down on, I encourage you in the strongest possible terms to engage in that. I'm going to. Okay, Jim. The CDFI Fund was established in 1994 to promote community and economic development. The CDFI Financial Assistance generates $12 in private capital for every dollar in CDFI grants. Headquartered in Mason County, Peninsula Community Federal Credit Union is leveraging a $2 million grant to provide credit to those with subprime credit scores so that they can have reliable transportation. The CDFI fund is proposed to be eliminated, I did not know that, Jim, by the president's proposed budget. What can be done to protect the CDFI fund? Did you get CDFI in there enough, buddy? <laughs> to continue to promote economic development. I don't know a lot about CDFI, but thanks to Jim Morrell, the CEO of Peninsula Community Federal Credit Union in Shelton, I do know something about it. And I think it's an outstanding mechanism to leverage public dollars with private investment to lift people up. Again, Jim, it's a part of the broader budget debate. My admonition to most people who have areas of the, of the budget that they are concerned about is don't allow yourselves to become a part of the Donner Party. Um, you know, CDFI wins at community college's expense or community colleges win at Hope and Shop in some of the uh, home assistance programs, uh, at some of the education that you lose at, to the benefit of the education. Uh, frankly, I think if ever there was a time when we were all in this together, it's now. Uh, where are we? Lauren. Okay. Hi, my name is Tambourine. I do want to thank you for being here because it is very important for our representatives to uh, meet with their constituents. Um, we'd love to see you more often. So I, I also want to tell you I appreciate you saying that you don't believe that corporations are people and their money um, equals free speech because that is one of the most important subjects to people all over this country. I sat in on the steps of the Capitol in DC uh, protesting Citizens United because the thing is, is everyday people, um, their concern is with politicians that they say one thing and they do another. And in all fairness, uh, the thing is, is most everyday people uh, hold in their thinking that how can politicians represent the people if they are getting paid exorbitant amounts of money to represent the interests of corporations. So I say this with all due respect. When your constituents may look and see that insurance companies are some of the greatest donors to your campaign, um, then one might question, well, is that why he voted against single payer and for something that is really, as, as uh, the lady up there said, that it uh, benefits the insurance companies? These are the things that we have to address because otherwise you lose the trust of the people because they see one thing, and if one thing is being said, there has to be some congruity. So I, I felt that it, it, uh, it was notable to be able to bring that uh, to your attention. Well, and, and, <laughs> and, and thank you. Uh, as I said at the outset, I'm a big boy. I, I can take that kind of input. Look. The only thing I can say won't satisfy you. Uh, I have intermittently been in and out of public office and in positions of public trust my whole adult life. And I ask only to be judged on the basis of that 40-year track record. 
Uh, I believe in my heart of hearts and with good conscience that I approach this job and make decisions on the basis of integrity and that which I believe is in the best interest of the people of the district. And if you conclude otherwise based on campaign finance reports, you're free to do that, Tambourine. But uh, I, I sleep well at night. I work real hard for the people of this district, and I'm more than willing to subject myself to their judgment on an every other year basis. I'm just fine with that. And I do appreciate your coming. Thank you very much. All right. I am running out of energy. What alternative budgets are under discussion? Trump's budget is unacceptable. What else can we put forward? But generally, the way this works, and it's a good one to conclude on since tonight was supposed to be about the budget, uh, is, that, um, is that the chair of the, of the budget committee puts out his proposal, and the ranking member puts out the alternative. Uh, and those are kind of the competing visions. In a functional or a healthy process, there might be a meeting of the minds there that says, Kate, Katie, who left, indicated uh, that's generally not the way it's working these days. But you, will, you can expect for there to be an alternative budget put, about, put out by the ranking member of the Budget Committee. I am out of steam, uh, and I ask your forgiveness for that. Uh, but I do want to end where I began, which is to tell you how very much I appreciate your coming here tonight. I really do. What I, what I genuinely believe is that most people have a lot going on in their lives, and that you would give up some time to come here this evening and be a part of this dialogue uh, is, is frankly a measure of good citizenship. And so whether you leave here agreeing with me or not, please know I appreciate that every single one of you is here. So thank you very, very much. Thank you.